Now, the refugee students, they came from the southern part of Sudan, a country which has been racked by decades of war or the threat of war from the north. Now, today and from July 9, 2011, they're independent country and that is their proud flag. Now, even though we've got uh, slightly um, less numbers in South Australia of the South Sudanese refugees, according to the latest census, it's slightly uh, higher percentage of the Australian um, total. Now, this is the context. It's a serious context. The disrupted learning in southern Sudan due to decades of war, and there's really only the oral literacy of languages. Dinka language was the one for this particular group, and uh, in a collective culture. Now, one of the greatest hurdles in coming to Australia is the limited uh, literacy in English as well and also the rigidity of the formal mainstream schooling in comparison to learning under a tree. Um, and to date there's no MILT model existing as a guide for learning for secondary teachers. Now these were the aims, we're trying to have uh, a learning compass I suppose to help secondary students understand refugees' distinctive learning experiences and particularly from this culture. How to engage with the students, enhance their learning, let alone lead them along the path towards autonomy. Now, using the two theories, humanistic sociology with cultural values and the second, symbolic interactionism with relationships and open-ended interviews of 19 students. And what we found that the paths of learning for the refugees were non-linear and also there were unique phases, as you will see shortly. And the, one of, another strong uh, result was the reliance on the teacher and also the students accessing their own prior learning and visibility issues. Now, going into the background, we really wanted a model to be skilled and realistic for teachers. We thought we'd be obviously looking at effective and cognitive phases, but with the effective, we wanted the positive and the negative as I said, to have a realistic snapshot and a guide for teachers. To help teachers um, gain an appreciation of the students' learning styles and again to develop to autonomy. And again, there's been no MILT model until this famous MILT model of today uh, for secondary teachers. Now the background, a lot of you would be aware, the trauma and the distress for the students coming in to Australia from all countries refugees, but particularly the South Sudanese. And this memory of war never leaves them. It's always fresh with them. And the knowledge of the Dinka language is an oral language from their oral tradition. And the stories at night, a bit like the indigenous, where they have they learn about morals. But so it's an oral culture. And English, they do have some formal schooling. They did have the mission schools and they've had government schools and learning under the tree, but um, it's uh, fragmented with the war. You'd have a student go to school one day and the school would be closed because the teachers had to go to war. So it's really important to know the context of this culture. So the English was limited and whilst in South Australia, I know every state has some um, uh, new arrivals programs, we have the NAP. This is a very good program. A lot of students feel a real sense of belonging and they come from a wide variety of cultures. And, but the problem is that when they go to the mainstream schooling, the, the rigid framework, the African sense of time, which they're used to back home, the problems and challenges are magnified. So in light of all these serious linguistic and learning hurdles, little information has been available about the personal learning styles of these students, particularly in MILT terms, and to have a model appropriate for them. So this has been a research gap, and what we wanted was to use or utilise the authentic voices and views which came from my research study uh, recently. So there's been a gap as to the personal views on how they learn best and what are the problems. So the starting point was to look at a MILT model and to look at the application for all sectors, not just the primary and the secondary and the tertiary, going on to TAFE, etc. Now these were the two theories that we used, the humanistic sociology 
which concentrates on cultural values, looking at the educational, the social, the religious, the linguistic and the sense of identity. This seemed to be a perfect choice um, for um, a, an underpinning theory. And secondly, the symbolic interactionism is to do with social interaction and examining relationships. Who are you, your relationships with? There are significant relationships, could be with a family member or a teacher, and generalised relationships where you are with a group, like it might be a classroom group. So using these two theories uh, to um, underpin the investigation, the initial investigation, there were three contexts, not just two countries, not just southern Sudan and Adelaide, but it was also the overlapping one, that third context, which... Uh, really shows you adaption or otherwise. What's actually going on? We know there's two extremes, but what is the meaning in the middle? So these were the methods used, qualitative research dealing with human actors. Secondary data was, um, came from my uh, study. Open-ended semi-structured interviews. Had to be very careful with these interviews, had to be very sensitive and uh, try to make them as the students as comfortable as possible. They lasted about an hour. The interviews were held in the student schools and they were transcribed and analysed. In some cases, I had to say to the students, could you please go home now? You have to go home and do homework. So they were very anxious to talk to me. And I later reflected, it was a bit like their day in court. Very rarely do people ask students, how are you feeling? What are your problems? And once you get an atmosphere of trust and rapport, which isn't easy to develop, they were very forthcoming. So the analysis for the MILT model, um, we were looking at engaging learning and teaching from secondary schools. And their actual words have been used to devise this MILT model. This is quite unique and I think it has a lot of meaning. Now we found that as we expected, the Dinka language was mainly oral and as people here who are language teachers know, if you have limited literacy in your mother tongue, it's very hard to learn another language. And a lot of uh, migrants face this. And so um, that's a real hurdle when they come in. And the school curriculum, it's not just the unfamiliar subjects like business studies. What does that mean? They have the rigidity of the secondary school and the primary, where you have a timetable, punctuality, dress, hair, Again, it's not the African sense of time, which is quite different to the Western uh, style. So there's a lot they have to cope with, and that's a hurdle in itself, even though they really prize the golden opportunities in Australia. That is without a doubt. But it's still very difficult for them. And teachers expect them just to finish the task. Get on, here we are, here's the maths exercise, just do it. So it's very difficult. So we made up a milk. Uh, model. And this took quite a lot of hard work to find the right words. Now in A, in the standard model, you've got embark and clarify. Well, how could these students possibly clarify their learning paths? How is that possible when they've come from an unstable learning environment, limited literacy in the mother tongue, limited literacy in English? So we changed that to embark and wonder, where are we going? A great sense of excitement. But I'm afraid there was disorientation too, balancing it. Very keen, but who do you go? Where do you go? Now, they couldn't find and generate like the classical milk model. How could they generate? They really didn't know where they were. They were curious and they were puzzled, but they kept trying to be proactive and find a sense of direction. Now, the very strong um, phase that was accessed here was number C. And this came from their own learning from home from a, a mother figure or a family member where they'd observe and imitate the learning. They'd learn languages that way, many languages, and other skills such as art, dance, drama, woodwork. These are skills that people don't know that they have. So they kept trying, but this wasn't a given either. They might have been determined, but they were equally frustrated. I'm afraid to say that there's a lot of racism in classes and uh, there's a lot of um, you know, difficulties there. So they did try to keep going and they were discerning but they were anxious. E was very important. They accessed their own creative background. 
Um, they used sport for the research project. They used, um, took up dance and drama. In the so the students actually did this. You know, the teachers always say, oh, you must access the students learning. But this is what the students did of their own volition. And then up to F, some of them were lucky enough to get up that far. But it wasn't linear. Uh, they didn't really ever go back to A again. That was, and, and B wasn't likely. C and E were the very common uh, phases. <coughs> And I, I'll skip through this a bit, seeing as though you've, you've seen it, but it's all in their words and in the verbs and with the question. The students spoke about their feelings. Now, this is very interesting. This is a frequency count. But as mentioned, the one for the teacher was, was number one by far, and number two was accessing their own creative learning of the past and trying to analyse and apply and reflect and so on. But it was very difficult uh, for these students. Now, I find this quite interesting. This is a real insight into what the students told me. Number A, uh, C rather, the history teacher was cheerful and fun. But I'm afraid, miss, as they'd say to me, some teachers just sit there. They ignore us. Um, number E, this girl was very innovative. She said, I remember. Um, when we had all the stories and the dancing and singing in the churches, it was all very dramatic with the different tones of voice. So I choreographed the whole Year 7 concert. That was her idea. And that was a creative breakthrough and a sense of identity in her learning. So um, going on further, one of the other students decided to take that topic up for his research project to try and help the students. And number uh, N, uh, D, this student was an independent type of student anyway. I had taught him myself. But he said, Miss, look, it's easier for me to be independent. If I ask the teachers, you know, I don't know how to ask them, when to ask them. Um, uh, it's very difficult. Now, this number A is a typical response. So excited on arrival, but there's all these Caucasians around. This is really shocking. We look different. And so the visibility is a hurdle they have to personally overcome. But it doesn't help them if the teachers aren't very accepting too. And the last one, this young man, he said, well, miss, there's good and there's bad teachers. But he said, oh, I really love the way they always keep coming back. And I thought that was, that was quite charming. Um, so this is really an authentic um, model that was made up from the students' comments. And uh, further experiment could be recommended to go into the other sectors. And of course, refugee students go on to learn to um, take up apprenticeships and other careers. But I really did, we did feel that um, teachers need some sort of guide. Otherwise, it's a mystery. So this was my thesis on digital of understanding how these students view the support from teachers. I know all students see teachers as important, but these, these students in particular really do need understanding, direction, attention, uh, would really be helpful. Thank you.